What is up, chaps? It is me, Liz Lau, back again with another reaction for you, beautiful people. And finally, we are back with another Unlucky Tug reaction. And the last last one we did was a couple months ago. Uh, it was a couple months ago. It was the S Thomas and Friends Season 1 retrospective. And it was definitely, it was very kind of inform. <sighs> It wasn't really the way I was kind of expecting it. It was. It didn't really have... The format was very loose, how he did it. It was more or less kind of explaining the season as a whole before going into it. Because normally when you see like things like this, they normally kind of go through... Um, I've seen some people go through each episode, and I'm just like... We just don't have time for that, you know, for like a, an entire season retrospective. But he, he just... He, concise, he, got to, he got to the point... It was very concise, very informative, like, um, like everything about that video was just, it was unlucky tug goodness, is what it was, and it's why I just, it's why I keep coming back to this channel, um, honestly, because he just, he, he delivers, somehow he manages to deliver a new perspective on something that I've been a fan of for a very, very long time. And it, it, it's quite phenomenal, really. And hopefully the same applies to Season 2 as retrospective of Season 2. My personal thoughts on the season, I definitely think it's a step up from Season 1. Like, Season 1, like like he said, that kind of bare-bones um, interpretation of Thomas that uh, makes Season 1 stand out. Season 2 kind of made it a bit more... Um, I, f I, I don't know, I feel, I feel, I feel, it felt a bit more grounded for me, like, you weren't distracted by, like, the first season, um, I'm just gonna call it first season syndrome, uh, when it, when it comes to, like, because Thomas, like, you could tell, um, that kind of the production was kind of, uh, fairly low end, um, compared to, especially compared to season two, and, like, they actually, I found out the other day, they actually had to, uh, use grocery grass in the first, um, in the first season, um, like for like artificial grass um the second one but i i don't know i feel like since we're less distracted by that kind of bare bones low end lower end production value we can actually focus um a bit more on kind of the upsides of season two i'm not sure if i'm making any sense by saying that but i think also in terms of like overall stories season two is so much better like, it has so so many bangers. Edward's Exploit, Ghost Train, The Disease, the disease All, um... What, what else? Um, The Missing Coach? Ha! <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this video. So, like, like I said, Season 2 definitely, um, a I think is a better season than Season 1. So it'll be interesting seeing his kind of, uh, view, view on the matter. So, and I hope you guys are as well. Drop the video a like if you enjoy. Subscribe to the channel too if you want to see more content like this. And let's go. So this is Thomas and Friends Season 2, 1986, in retrospect, the Thomas retrospective by the Unlucky Tog. Tog? Unlucky Tug. <laughs> This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and you can participate in choosing what video comes Let me know if you're an unlucky tug patron in the description. Just something Dear Christopher. Oh, this intro is sick as well, I'm not going to lie. Here this is intro your is sick. Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. Because he used that theme. Because he used that theme in the um in his um Eppleton Hall video. But and also this is an interesting question: is what makes a good sequel? It's definitely um. Okay, I think I'm gonna elaborate. So f for me, for me certainly, what makes a good sequel? And what I'm gonna say is is kind of is a bit gin is something you've heard before. But to kind of keep the charm of the original, but to improve, but to improve upon what was lacking in the first one. So, I know, I know we've, we've heard that all before, but it's seriously true, like, kind of, the whole purpose of a sequel is to take what made the original good, that, assuming the original was good, um, and, and just make it better. Like, it's a, it's a simple concept, really, and a lot of sequels fall into the pitfalls of, of failing to do that, to be honest, fail to kind of understand what made the original so good, and thus, many people regard sequels as kind of, it's, 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 it's so, it's, it's very strange with sequels, like, either, like, sequels are 
like hated, like I'll I'll down I'll down there with people's least favorite films of all time, or like a good sequel, like Terminator Two, great example. Uh, like great sequels are regarded as kind of some of the greatest movies of all time. <laughs> It's, uh, it's it's very unique, the whole concept of sequels. And I definitely think with Thomas, it's one of those things that... Because season one... Sta- like I said, season one kind of started... It started with production value, but not as much as kind of... They know kind of... The, the series was popular, like, when it first came out. And they know kind of... They know kind of what works. And, like, two years removed from that, they kind of... They do... They do... They try... They try... They try something else with it. They try to kind of build upon that, but also kind of make it look a bit more professional. I think that's the case with Thomas and Thomas and Friends. But let's hear uh, Unlucky Tug's thoughts on this, shall we? Well, in movie terms, what a good sequel should do is take the settings and characters present in the first movie and tell a new story with them while also continuing the story already established. A good sequel plays with new tones, new themes, and puts the characters I watched. Uh, I watched Toy Story 2 the other day, actually. It's an incredible film. A good sequel ultimately shows growth from the previous, raises the stakes a bit, and most importantly, feels necessary. Season one of Thomas the Tank Engine, for what it was, was a perfect start to the series. It overall was a rather linear story, with a solid start and a conclusive end with the minimalist cast of characters. Uh. You can watch all of season one And that's the thing, like, what I was criticizing, the the whole idea that it was minimalist was not me critiquing it. Like, in fact, it's a very good thing. Like I said, like he he said, with that kind of bare bones, uh, raw interpretation of Thomas, it actually worked in the season's favor, considering... It actually worked in the series, sorry for the door slamming. But it actually worked in the series' favor, is what I'm saying. By the end of it, it tells a complete story. Season 2 takes these characters and settings and expands on them. More characters, character arcs of both existing and new faces, more of the island of Sodor we haven't seen before, Mm. it introduces some new maturer themes and a slightly darker tone that the cheerful season 1 didn't play with. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Season 2. Definitely agree with the tonal shift uh, there in in season two. Definitely agree with that. After the warm reception of season one and its home run success in video sales, it was very quickly another season of Thomas was greenlit. Production on the second season started in early 1985, a few months after season one had finished airing. Season two continued the same production team through Clearwater Features, David Mitten returning as director, Robert Cardona returning as producer, and Mike and Jr. returning as composers. Even what Ringo legend. Starr came he, back. Actually, I looked in the comments section for this. I think it was either Re- Robert D. Cardona or Jr. Campbell. One of them actually commented um, on Unlucky Tug's video, and that comment is pinned. Check it out. It's absolutely insane. Because one, one of them has a YouTube channel. Jr. Campbell, R- Robert D. Cardona. Not R- Robert D. Cardona. <laughs> was narrator. Mike O'Donnell. Everyone involved with Season Sorry. 1 made a return to this season. From a production standpoint, everything My brain was pretty is fried much the again, same, I'm sorry. With only one big change. Where it was filmed. Season 2 was the first season to be filmed at Shepperton Studio. Oh, fun, fun fact. Shepperton. That was where Alien was filmed. Ser- seriously, like, I, fa- I found that out. Like, Tugs was also filmed there as well, <laughs> for, like, Thomas fans, but... One, 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 I... ...goes in England. I just thought that was a very cool fact to lay on you guys. ...from then on. This new season presented a unique challenge. What stories would they adapt this time around? Season 1 very linearly followed the outline of the Railway Series books, covering the stories of the first eight books in order, while combining some here and there. They could have just picked up right where they left off, starting with Edward's book, and doing everything after it. The issue was, some of the books in that lineup would be impossible to adapt due to the limitations of the model sets. For example, they couldn't do the Scarlowy books because they hadn't figured out how to do Narrow Gauge yet. They couldn't do stories that featured weird one-off foreign engines because the budget wouldn't allow them to build. Granted, they did Percy Jackson Plus. They can't wait. To be honest, it does make me. It does make me wonder though, because, like with like Percy takes the plunge, they just put Bill and Ben in the in the in the characters before they actually appeared. So I wonder why. It does make you wonder why they didn't just do that. 
characters that it appear in only a I suppose scene. it would be a bit jarring the considering like of... they, Bill and Ben were characters introduced um as the as the series went on. Ball was that the next few books had shockingly very little Thomas in them. Show creator Brett Allcroft made the decision to focus the show around the character of Thomas instead of having it be an ensemble series like the books. See, I feel like people would see that as a fault, but you must remember that kind of this was kind of when it was in its early years and kind of starting to create its own identity. When you have, like, this was before when he was shoehorned into every single episode, when he was just shoehorned into the limelight. But Thomas, um, to kind of start off the series, they need to kind of, they need a selling point. Because the series itself is called Thomas and Friends. So they need a kind of, they need to put him in the limelight somehow. So I think really kind of, this feels like more like a, um marketing decision to benefit the show rather than like the rather than the merchandising and kind of money money making side of it which um hit uh, got into or when it, when we got when we got into like the 2000s so this is kind of so before you critique like brit for this kind of decision it's a it, it i feel like it was a necessary one well from a marketing standpoint this was a great idea we'll now start to see some of the drawbacks of that they had a contract in place that all episodes in the show had to be based on existing oh, I know where this is going. material. The show was not allowed to write its own stories at this time. Well, they used up most of the Thomas-centric stories in the books in season one, leaving very few left, so they were pretty strict. I never realized that. That's Percy's face mask. That's, look at that. That's Percy's face mask. I never realized that. Except for Thomas-centric content. A brand new Thomas season with little episodes. Cause look, he's got a tired. Cause look, he's got a tired face mask already. Just on Thomas himself, just wouldn't fly. By 1986, though, Chris Bit Audrey, topic, the Bina. son of Wilbert Audrey, had rebooted the book series. So Britt Allcroft and Co. commissioned him to write a new book solely about Thomas, so they'd have a selection of Thomas-centric stories to use for the show. The book, called More About Thomas the Tank Engine... I'm just saying, this is my least favorite railway, se railway series book. Because, like, you can tell that it was rushed to um, make... Um, for, for it to reach the deadline of season two. Like, it's... The stories feel so rushed in this. Most imaginative title ever, released in 1986. Yeah. Only two days before season two aired. Talk two about days! Three of the four stories in the book became episodes. Thomas, Percy, and the Cole, The Runaway, and Better Late Than Never. Weirdly, the final story, Drip Tank, was dropped for unknown reasons. My assumption is because Season 2 was already very Percy-heavy, and they didn't want another Percy story in the lineup. But I'll get more into that in a bit. Some other stories came from different sources. One- can I just say one thing? I think we might get into this, because, um... I feel like they should have replaced, uh, Drip Tank with Better Late Than Never, because... Like, honestly, you could have kept, you could have crept a recurring arc with Thomas Percy and the Cole. You could have ended the episode with them, like, hating each other and end it with That's Another Story and then go into Drip Tank where they kind of resolve it. And then you can do the, do, do the runaway and, the, and, oh, and drop. And to be honest, like, if, if I had to choose, like, drop better late than never, because that episode is so boring. <laughs> Sources that were not present in the books and also One just really episode, and also really Tom and also just really confusing like what is the message of that and Trevor was anyway I'm getting a off topic story again. written by Chris Audrey that would later become a story in an annual technically it was this not really a story. series I like but it was written by an Audrey so it was fair play the finale episode, Thomas and the Missing Christmas Tree, was again based on a one-off book written specifically to tie into the TV show, not a main series one. Unlike season one, which was Thomas a linear Christmas telling of the stories well. in the first eight books in order, season two became a compilation of stories randomly plucked out of the books. All of the Edward book stories, most of the Percy book stories, most of the Duck and Diesel book stories, some of Branch Line Engines, some of mainline engines, the first two stories of tramway engines, some stories pulled from a book written specifically for TV, a random annual story. He's being very, he's being very, um, <laughs> he's being very strange with how he's saying some and mo, some and most. Most, I'm assuming he means kind of three story, more, because there are four stories in each railway series book. Three of them, I'm guessing, is what he means by most. Then he said some mainline engine stories, Diesel, Wrong Road, and. <laughs> Diesel, Wrong Road, and 
and Edward's exploit were adapted in season two. That's most of the book. I don't know, just your grammar's a bit all over the place, and lucky tug, mate, I'm not gonna lie. And another one-off Christmas story to finish the season off. Seems like a total mess compared to how straight edge and linear season one was. But somehow, they made it work. Cleverly creating a loose top-level narrative in which everything feels connected. Season two was also the year oh, nice, of cancelled nice. episodes. Several stories from the books were considered for this year, including Percy's Promise, Double Header, and Gordon Goes Foreign. Not see, see, Gordon Goes Foreign and Percy's Promise, I can kind of understand. Like, Percy's Promise, because you can imagine, like, those water effects, man. Bloody hell. Like, like how, how difficult must that be to work with at the time? And Gordon Goes Foreign is just, is way too expensive. Is way too expensive. Those are, it was a really, to be honest, it was a really stupid concept. You, we're going to get into the, what the actual concept was, but it was really stupid. None of these made it to the filming stage. However, the most famous cancelled episode into. was The Missing Coach, oh, no. aka the first story of the Donald and Douglas plot arc, which was nearly complete. As you know, I don't think it's going to go into Gordon's Ghost Forum. So basically what they were going to do is they were going to take Henry's model and adapt it uh, to... Um, to, with like side plates and stuff kind of disguise it as the big city as the foreign engine which is which is so stupid because you're just you're making that model specific you're adapting that model specifically for one episode and like it'd be so rec it'd be so distracting like you would easily be able to tell right away that that was henry <laughs> you would you would seriously be able to tell right away but a anyway missing but yeah the missing coach is the most notable I'd say. When Brit cancelled it towards the end of filming. Her reason being the story had very little action and was too confusing. Which honestly, I totally get. That story in particular is a total mess, involving a plot where Donald and Douglas switch their tenders to confuse yeah, like, their identities. What were they trying to accomplish? Like what were they trying to accomplish? Like they just <laughs> Like they just switch ten tenders and hope the fact controller never finds out. The episode is very unique for the series, though, as it got far enough in production to actually have the majority of it filmed. Hmm. Photos of the completed scenes have surfaced online, and many fans have attempted to reconstruct the episode with the sources available. Hmm. There has been much speculation really cool, of what episode the replaced coach the missing coach in the lineup. I believe the current consensus is that Better Late Than Ever was the replacement episode. Oh, but until it I think I think it was actually some people have said it was Thomas Percy and the Cole. It was it was something from Tank Engine Thomas again that replaced the crew it. Crew members steps forward to confirm that it's no, not Tank Engine Thomas again. More about Thomas. And Production Tom. ended in I don't care, okay. and the season premiered on September 24th with the episode Thomas Percy and the Cole. Almost two years since the season one finale. Ads. Sorry. Season 2 has the reputation among fans of being the gritty season. Like, of the classic <laughs> seasons, I'd say the general reputations are that Season 1 is the slower one, Season 3 is the adventurous one, Season 4 is the comfy one, Season 5 is the cinematic one, and Season 2 is the gritty one. And there's good reason for that. I can see that. Season 2 was a lot more workmanlike than Season 1 both in its presentation, it's got a real industrial its feel design, to it. and how it was filmed. Allow me to explain. Let's first talk about the camera work. Going straight from season 1 to 2, the biggest new innovation of the show visually is Moving how camera. much they play with how they use the camera. There is so much more movement with it this year, with an abundance of panning and zooming and tracking shots. And when I say an abundance, I mean Literally, almost every single episode has an impressive moving camera shot. Some have several. The only episode to not feature a moving shot in any regard is The Runaway. Of That's all literally episodes! literally the only one I checked. In fact, let's count them. I can't tell if this is a fault or if he's kind of, or if it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing, to be honest.
Jesus Christ. I think you all get the picture at this point. Season two loved moving the camera around. You won't get many shots like this in season two, where the camera has to be in this exact spot so the details added in the foreground are visible. Let's keep in mind that season one was filmed in a small studio, in what was no bigger than an average household garage, and that would have played a big factor in the decision to keep the camera static for most of that season. They couldn't do impressive panning shots across the set because there wasn't much of a set to begin with. If the camera panned over a few inches, the set's edge would be revealed. They were more constrained with what they could actually do with the camera, and those limitations aided that season's aesthetic. Since season two was the first season filmed in an actual studio, with much more space and versatility to work with, they took full advantage of it with the camera work here. Season 2 wasn't concerned with creating beautiful static frames that looked like paintings. It was more interested in wowing the audience with impressive camera work and dynamic angles. Again, I can't tell if this is a positive or a negative. I suppose really, like, if this was in Season 1 with the aesthetic they went for, then maybe it would be a bit jarring, but I feel like Season 2, with like the grittier tone it has, uh, honestly, I, it kind of works in its favor. It was more workmanlike, with more freedom. This was more or less a guerrilla style season, getting the shots needed as efficiently and quickly as possible. So instead of strategically placing details in the foregrounds of shots, now all the sets are grimy and messy with little details sprinkled everywhere. So no matter where you place the camera, you're seeing some sort of point of interest on the set. This new grit makes this world feel so much more lived in as a result. There we Sodor go. Sodor is slowly making the transition purely from a storybook world to a real world. I wouldn't say Season 2 is beautiful in the same way Season 1 is. Season 2 was more workmanlike, mm. more energetic, more gritty. And that's not to say that those Season 1-esque storybook sets and here's made the this thing. too a- It, it kind of overcomp overcompensates with the lighting in Season 2. Like, okay, we talked about like Season 1, everything looks like dawn. Now in Season 2, every everything looks like it's in dusk. Just, <laughs> the overcompensation is remarkable. Specific camera shot are not a thing this season. We do get a nice handful of those, like this one of the ruined castle, for instance. And they will continue That's to be staples for the rest of Mitten's tenure. Secondly, let's talk about the overall tone. Season 2 introduced to us that while the show's universe is a very comfy, joyous and storybook-like one that these characters inhabited, there was also an underlying darkness and sophistication to it too, which really comes to surface Good in attention. episodes like Pop Goes the Diesel, where Diesel flat out says diesels are the future of railways. We come to a yard and improve it. We are revolutionary. Or Edward's exploit, where the engines discuss Edward's eventual obsolescence. He should give eyebrows. up and be preserved before it's too late. Or Saved from Scrap, where the show, for the very yeah. first time ever, deals with the concept of death. My master says I'm old-fashioned. They're going to break me up next week. The tone of season two was subtly darker than what we had previously. It stepped its toes into that territory of those questions we prefer to not have the answers to. Mm. The reveal of dieselization and the concept of scrapping are both introduced this year. Honestly, with I, I kind of, I, I don't, I don't know what it is, but I, it's, it's, it's always the way with um, the reason. Kind of other seasons are more popular. It's the, no, why no one really remembers Saved from Scrap is kind of, it's because it's so kind of subtle. Which is, it's something I never really thought about, because I'm kind of, the re I, like, I admire the kind of later seasons for just how in your face they are about kind of the idea of kind of death, kind of idea of like death. If Douglas wasn't there to save Oliver, Oliver would have died, effectively. They, d they don't like sugarcoat that at all. And yeah, that's a praise, but at the same time, it's equally kind of... It's it's an equally it's kind of like 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 Tug said it's them kind of subtly kind of moving themselves into that kind of territory and kind of establishing and and establishing like an overall tone for it and how it needs to be dealt with is is very is very kind of it's very it's very important and also you must remember kind of the time period that this was in it very in fact very um reflective of the time period here because like 
it was like scrap was something kind of it was it was coming with like the introduction of diesels but it was very kind of it was very slow moving it was a very kind of slow kind of slow kind of rev- revolution like d di- like diesels had only just has only had only just come in, come into existence like only very old pieces of machinery like trevor were being scrapped it's kind of some it's something that wasn't really um as apparent as it was in the later se- as it was in the later seasons where where like like season 3 for example where every single engine was being scrapped effectively <laughs> Which both so very, become major very plot points for the rest of the show. Very reflective. Suddenly, Thomas the Tank the Engine isn't just a happy storybook world. Mm. It's now a slightly realer world with actual real life consequences. Mm. Times change, an engine's life can end, and they all at some point will be obsolete. Pretty heavy stuff. On a lighter note, let's talk about Ringo. Ringo Starr's performance is a lot more energetic this time around. Oh yeah. You can tell he had a lot more fun this season, giving much more energy to his line deliveries. Suddenly he heard an extraordinary noise. Whee! Why does he snort like a pig? I don't understand. Jesus, lost patience. Oh, I love this! <laughs> this is so funny. Lord. Gave a great heave. Trucks get forward. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's, it's the trucks. It's, it's the trucks. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Let me in. I'll chop and I'll puff and I'll break your door in. And even attempting emphasis on attempting different accents. Oh no! Don't it fast yourself, Thomas. We'll soon have you back on the rails. Lush sakes, Donald. It's Henry! Do not fetch yourself, Henry! To be fair, I don't think I could do a Scottish accent any better. <clears throat> don't worry yourself, Henry! Uh, you know, no, 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 no. Nope. Don't I, worry yourself, Henry. Wait that. a while. Ringo's- wait, a, wait a while. We'll get you out. The more monotone performance matches the more I have a Scottish grandfather, so. Season, one. season two is quite a bit more exciting, so this newfound energy he brings fits perfectly. Spite Dougie, would ya? Spite Dougie, would ya? Something that I heavily praise each season of the classics is how each one explores. Hey, hey, I'm just saying, write my Scottish accent in the comments. Write my Scottish accent. New okay? parts of the right? island of Sodor. Constantly. I'll also punch your fucking teeth and. And season two I does awful, not sorry. disappoint in that regard. I, I that, season right. one was very mainline and Thomas's branch line focused, which makes sense since the majority of the stories that year were either Thomas or Gordon focused. Season 2 is the Edwards branch line season, with a very heavy emphasis on everything in that part of the island. Okay. This year we saw a ton of Brendam docks, Trevor's Orchard, the Clay Pits, etc. Oh, hi. We also get to see some more places on Thomas's branch line that we missed out on last time, like the Farquhar Quarry that was only mentioned in Season 1, the big yard with the sheds in Tidmouth where the engines stay, and that ever picturesque water mill. Even the main line gets a little bit more built out, with the addition of the big yards where all the rolling stock is stored, and even a new station too. Hmm. Season 2 was the year of darker elements, the year of Edward's branch line, the year of cancelled episodes, and also the year of crashes. Oh, that's so clever! That's so clever, Edison. How you kind of... I was, like, I was kind of thinking, like, why is a runaway theme playing? And I was like, J- unused husbands. Then it sees, shows, the, shows, shows, the, shows the clip of, per- of, per- of Percy crashing. I was like, oh, yeah. One had four crashes, two of which were pretty violent. It's safe to say that they hadn't really figured out crashes yet in the first season. That and the fact the stories they adapted didn't really call for that many. But by season two, they were going all out. The crashes occur very frequently, but in typical Mitten fashion, all are treated with an amount of dread and seriousness. Mm. They are not played off as jokes. So many things are just destroyed this year. From <laughs> to houses, to barber shops, to farm carts, to brake vans, which weirdly happens twice. In the same way, uh, season two solidified yeah, that- Mitten's got a real vendetta against brake vans, doesn't he? <laughs> The steam versus diesel feud and the concept of scrapping will be main staples in the show moving forward. It also solidifies. I still can't. I can't stop doing the Scottish accent. I'm sorry. We're going to be a mainstay. See, that's the thing. That's the thing. Yeah, I know. I kind of faked that cringe a little bit. 
Um, <laughs> I know I kind of faked that cringe a little bit, but that's ca that's seriously just how they kind of impact with like the music and like the actual the real impact of the crashes is felt. I feel the real impact of the seriousness of the situation is felt. Also, ads. God damn it. Who did stuff? Let's now this get year. into the characters. We got a whole lot to cover here. When it comes to who got to do stuff this season, Percy is clearly the season's winner, with a grand total of eight lead roles. Thomas is in second with seven, and Edward is in third with six. Edwards, See? I'm just saying, like, I know he does MVP of the season. Edward's MVP of this season for me, hands down. <laughs> Honest, honestly, like, he, sa he, saves he saves Trevor from scrap, Proves he's not a worth. Proves he's not a worthless heap of junk. Saves James. Like he he does it all this season. He's hands down the MVP. Season two beefed up a lot of the characters that were sort of shafted in season one. This was the year of Edward and Percy, the two of the seven mains who got very little focus in season one. Even Bertie the Bus gets some beefing up with two major roles this time around. That's a lot for him. Thomas, huh. as always, gets his fair share of time in the spotlight. And in every major Thomas appearance this season, he is a jerk. If we hurried ah. past the viaduct, it might collapse. And then you'd have no passengers at all. What would you do then? Run my train on time for one thing. In fact, this is probably the jerkiest Thomas season of them all. He's at his worst here. Every time we see him, he has a bone to pick with someone about something. Hmm. He's mad at Percy for making his paint dirty. He thinks Trevor is inferior to him. He's jealous of Duck for taking Annie and Clarabelle. He's upset about the big engines making him late. He gloats he's clever enough to drive himself. He's upset at Percy for having an accident and supposedly blocking the line. Percy's had an accident, cried I Toby. I, 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 I'm just like, I, I'm just always like, it's like, Percy's had an accident. If Toby's effectively told him that his best friend died. And I was like, I was like poor engine. Oh, damn it, that means I'll be late. <laughs> That means I'll be late. Thomas does not have a major character arc this season like he did in season one. He's more so a constant this time around, but he is consistent and in line with the truest form of his character, the pricky, cocky, bratty Thomas that we all know and love. Your ugly fizz is enough to frighten anyone. The other characters we saw a lot of oh. last year take a step back from lead roles this season. Also, talk about dicks, the big engines in the Duck and Diesel trilogy. Bloody hell. Mostly two group appearances. Henry, Gordon, and James, who all got so much focus in season one, take a major step back. They all appear frequently, but with little to do. James gets a single lead, Gordon gets two leads, both of which are shared with Edward, and Henry has no spotlight episode at all, and I believe only speaks in five episodes total. These three oh, resound more to appear oh, more as a that. big group this season. There are multiple episodes where the big three band together. They get blocked out of the shed. They stand up to duck. They all talk smack about Edward. They try to think of ways it's to save It's interesting. The like, they are a driving force of kind of... Like, they, they, it's, it's almost like they're driving... I, I wouldn't necessarily call them the antagonists of the, seri of the series. Like, that obviously belongs to Diesel and possibly the spiteful brake van. But, um... Like I definitely think they're they're almost anti hero anti villains or anti heroes in a way because they just push against they like think of how, like how they treat Duck and Edward they just push against them and it may makes them it makes them kind of fight fight through fight through them so they're just an extra obstacle for people to get for for the engines to get past <laughs> and it and it's just, it's it's so interesting how they're characterized here it's kind of like. Like you could definitely tell they they you can definitely tell they they mean well as they especially like at at the end of Edward's exploit where they were res respectfully silent you can tell they aren't bad but at the same time you can kind of they're kind of anti heroes in this season and it's almost like the fact that all all three of them are together are one kind of driving force against the kind of protagonist trying to prove themselves effectively uh, which which the protagonist does and the and the three engines are put and that driving force is proved wrong. Douglas so, you know, from being split up. Disgraceful. Oh, this catchphrase is iconic. Despicable. Finish. Detestable. What? Henry. In terms of characters who have big arcs Sorry. this season, Percy is one of I the promised, most notable. I promised myself I wouldn't make a Victor Tanzig joke in this, so. Percy was honestly kind of nothing in season one. You understood he was a cheeky little scamp, 
but that was kind of it. This year, we get to know quite a bit more. He retains his cheeky, mischievous spirit from last season, though we also learn he is rather naive and prone to getting taken advantage of by the bigger characters. Percy's arc this year was learning to stand up for himself, whether that being standing up to the big engines with Duck, taking a stand against Harold the Helicopter, yeah. or plotting ways to pay Thomas out. <laughs> he even got a major status quo change, permanently moving out of the big yard and becoming a mainstay on Thomas's branch line. Of all the characters this Ooh, year, yeah. Percy is definitely the one who is in the most different place at the end than where he started. He has an Speaking all. of starts, the season's opener, Thomas, Percy, and the Cole solidified that Thomas and Percy are best frenemies and sets course for them being the show's main duo moving forward. This is an interesting development, considering the main pairing in Season 1 was Thomas and Gordon. The show seemed to very quickly ditch that duo being the main one for the series, and it makes me wonder if this was the reason they decided to have the seemingly out of order Thomas, Percy, and the Cole as the premiere episode. It was it's, like the it's like, um, I don't, I, don't, I don't know, like I can understand why they did that, because like, Thomas and Percy are both tank engines, are kind of small engines, um, so they kind of have to band together, especially considering Gordon, Henry, and James are kind of driving against them. At the, at the same time, though, it does make me kind of question, like, since Thomas and Gordon were the major duo in season one, kind of the whole idea that kind of big big engines and tank engines, there's a kind of hidden message behind Gordon and uh, Thomas's relationship. That kind of no matter your no matter big or small. You kind of, we all need to kind of band together kind of thing. And I especially think, especially considering this season is about, um, considering this, considering this season is about, um, cool. is, is about kind of, it's, it's kind of hinting at like, like dieselization is coming. Um, I, I don't know. I, I wonder if the season would have benefited from that a bit more. And it, I do wonder. Show's way of saying, Thomas is back, baby. And Percy is now one of the main characters. Thomas and Percy are the show's two mains from here on out. Huh. Steam versus Diesels. Scrapping. Violent Crashes. And the Thomas and Percy duo. Season 2 really set up a lot of staples for the show. A lot more than I realized. Mm. There were several new characters introduced this year. And all of them have their own little individual arcs. I'm not going to go over all of them. But there are a couple I do want to quickly mention. Duck is probably the biggest of all the newbies this year, and he is a noteworthy standout because of his involvement in the Diesel plot arc, which is the heaviest of the season in my opinion. Duck is an interesting new character, being the show's third big station pilot engine, but very different to the previous ones. Thomas and Percy were both very cheeky to the big engines and prone to getting taken advantage of, while Duck is someone who is able to stand on his own ground and isn't afraid to talk back. Shut up! You're all jealous. The phenomenon of dieselization point. was a big topic this year, so naturally we were introduced to several diesel characters. Diesel, as the first diesel in the series, of course posed a threat to the steam engines, who were all too ignorant in this intro episode to fully realize that. After Diesel's departure, the audience is left with a gross taste in their mouths for diesels. Mm. They are the bad guys of the show moving forward. Yep. That's why I appreciate this season also introduced Boko. Who is the antithesis for the Diesel argument? I know, and also, this and also, you got to admire kind of Daisy's role. Daisy also playing a role in this because she's kind of in between. Like she starts out as a colossal Karen, and then as the series goes on, she actually she actually learns learns from her ways. So Daisy is the kind of nice little in between. Whilst Boko is just nice from the start. So those three Diesels, like they complete the season. Like the actual the use of those three Diesels specifically is very, very useful. I this think. is where I find it's Season very, very 2 very clever for how good. it weaved its seemingly random bunch of stories together. Having Diesel and Boko introduced in the same season worked a treat. Diesel represents the worst of Diesels, while Boko represents that not all Diesels are bad. And especially, because it, it's um, the background between um, the, the background between kind of di these Diesels classes. Diesel, so Diesel is a class 08, they, some of them are still around today. I kid you not. Like, I live in England. Like, I, I've seen a few. Like, they, they, they still exist today. Whilst Boko, the Class 28, the only, only one is left. Only, only one is left. Only one is left of Class 28 because they were such failures um, of Diesels. And I think definitely, um, if you watch um, 
Thomas one, Edward two, Henry threes. Um, <clears throat> if you watch Thomas one, Edward two, Henry threes, um, Boko um, saga in NWR Origins, um, you'll kind of he kind of presents kind of an interesting backstory as to why. And it's kind of it's something you kind of, it's something you kind of imagine that kind of because he is because he kind of knows what it's like. He kind of appreciates since he's a failed engine. He kind of appreciates that kind of every every engine is expendable at, in some in some form, and and so it's kind of, it, it it really makes sense for someone of his class to actually be to actually be nice class. It makes it sound like he's got like a higher social standing above everyone else, but um. You know, there's real, there's real thought. As you've got to applaud Audrey. There's real thought in kind of who, who, who the character design here. And like He's an easygoing, humorous guy, in a great contrast to the slimy types like Diesel. And we also got Daisy introduced this year too, who stands somewhere in the middle. With the introduction of these three by the end of the season, you know that some Diesels are bad and some are not so bad. I really like that. This is not a simple black and white world. There's much more nuance to it. When it comes to the MVP of the season, Edward. I think that Edward. award rightfully goes to Edward. Thank you. This is the Thank heaviest you. Good night. Edward season Thank you and ever. good night. There are no other seasons that have this many Edward episodes. Edward's arc this season is a happy coincidence of the random stories they strung together for this lineup. It works because we have the Edward book stories at the beginning of the season that set up Edward is getting old and worn out. Edward was getting old. His bearings <laughs> were worn, and he clanked as Oh, he nice, Ringo. <laughs> Over the course of the season, we are reminded numerous times by characters that Edward is old and not very respected by them. Edward is impossible. He clanks <laughs> about like a lot of old iron. I love, so I love that rant he has an old iron. Edward is impossible. Like, I so get that around... Like I, I love I love my I love my I love my uh, grandparents, but sometimes like especially like around technology or something that just that word impossible to work with. It's it's so it's it's so true. Like I again I love my grand I love my grandmother. And yeah, I, I'm I'm very very patient with her. It's it I, 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 I just find it so it's so strange. Like this is exactly how we see old people sometimes. Pathetic. He should give up and be preserved before it's too late. People say I'm old-fashioned, but I don't care. And it all Come finally on. builds up to the grand finale with Edward's exploit. The Love big episode that. where Love Edward episode. proves one final time he isn't a worthless old engine once and for all. Duck and Boko saw to it that Edward was left in peace. <laughs> Gordon and James remained respectfully silent. <laughs> This arc, paired with Edward's abundance of supporting roles and all the focus on his branch line, really mm. made it seem like Edward was the show's main character this season. I think an argument can be made that Percy also deserves the MVP mm. title, but I'm going to give it to Edward here because I have a feeling Percy may be getting that award a couple times in the seasons following. Mm. Damn it, ads again. Eve to me is basically freedom. It's a giant open universe where you can do... Season 2 had a crazy variety of stories, from light-hearted simple- I think I know what his fa what the best episode's gonna be. Okay, I'm not gonna like say, Thomas but I Trevor, do know. To exciting, tense ones that revolve around a chase sequence like Old Iron or A Close Shave, to more somber, melancholic ones like Dirty Work or Saved from Scrap. The season goes all Melancholic's over the place. a very good word. I think this season's standout episode award rightfully goes to- Ghost Train. Yep. Go do you remember? Do you remember when I said how kind of um, season two was a bit kind of subtle in the actual messaging? This is when they full on go all out with tone, and it's just phenomenal because of it. Like honestly, that beginning, it terrifies me, and like it's to this day. And they, I, I was talking about this with some friends the other day, actually. Um, the one of the reasons is it's just it's so unexpected. The actual, um, the actual t to actually go from like top, like as you said, season two has kind of been, it's been tense certainly and kind of gritty, but at the same time, there's still a kind of layer of laid of it feels kind of laid back, like some some elements feel very laid back about it, and then you get kind of you get the you get the joy for May themes, a ghost train, oh 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 ghost, oh it's probably just enough nothing, just da 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 da
Like it just goes, it just goes from that, and it, it that's what makes it so incredible. It's just like, oh, okay, okay, we're we're seeing some shit now. Ghost Train uniquely has a tone that the others don't. That's it what I'm is saying. The first spooky episode of the show, taking place almost entirely at night, excessively using fog effects to set the mood, combined with the score that could make your heart stop. Damn it, Tug. It just, it gets me every single time, this This was an theme. episode that always stood out to me as a kid. It leaves quite an impact. There are no other episodes like it in this season. There are no, there are hardly, yeah. hardly, um, yeah, there are episodes kind of that are very, very scary episodes, but there's hardly an episode like, like it, especially considering, like, that Ghost Train theme. There is no way real instruments could have made, um, the theme as scary. Like, on a, honestly, the synths make it terrifying. In my opinion, the episode that sums up Season 2, and this might be a bit of a bizarre choice, is Wrong Road. Wrong Road has all the elements Season 2 was known for. The Steam vs. Diesel feud, Edward presence, very impressive camera work, cool night shots, industrial sets, an atmospheric tone, etc. But it's all I feel like if just, just because an episode contains all of that... I don't, I don't think that kind of makes it sum up the season. It ultimately depends on kind of the delivery of all those things. And I'm, I'm trying to think, like, what kind of... I, 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 don't, I don't really have an alternative, if I'm totally honest, but if you do have an alternative uh, sum up episodes, then do let me know, because, I don't know, just Wrong Road just seems a... I don't, I don't know, I feel like there's, 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 like, a better one somewhere. That kind of sums up, that utilizes all those elements for some reason. I don't know. I, I, again, I like, maybe when I kind of think about it a bit more, maybe I won't, but at the same time, it kind of, I don't know, Wrong Road, it does feel a little bit random for me. Here. Wrong Road it's has just my all. opinion. It is very uniquely season two. I hate calling the worst episode of each season the worst one. Because the connotation of worst implies it From is From that bad. theme, it's going to be better late than never. Bad. Hands down. But that's not the case. There are no bad episodes in these first few seasons, in my opinion. But there are ones that are weaker than others. And my choice for the weakest of the lot this year goes to better late than never. Yeah. I do like the episode. And yeah, I like again, it it's not up. bad. It's just kind of... It's it's just kind of all over it's just kind of all over the place and just nothing really happens. On Thomas and Bertie's rivalry in season one. It's time we had another race. I reckon I could beat you now. Nice continuity there. But in a season that is very plot driven, where every story is a part of some multi episode out of place. arc, this episode doesn't really relate to anything and just sort of wastes time. It exists just so Thomas could have another spotlight episode this year, and that's really it. He was really fighting for the limelight this year with all the Percy and Edward focus. <sighs> a shame that the Thomas Spotlight Hog Syndrome, something the later seasons are plagued with, had its roots this One early. thing I will say is that I kind of, um, I, one thing I do like about the episode is how Thomas kind of, um, he kind of put, like, you can see he's kind of, with that rivalry with Bertie, rivalry with Bertie, he's willing to kind of put that aside for the sake of the passengers, showing that he's not just purely a dick the entire season. And it's just like, it's just like, it, it kind of, it reflects so much better on him as a character, really. It kind of, it just, because like, all these episodes have been him being a prick in some way. But seeing him uh, kind of actually put that aside is very kind of, it's very, it's, it reflects well on this character. It shows, you, it, it, it's, it's not a, he's not a character you want to hate this season, is what I'm saying. Really, in the series. I suppose this episode also feels like filler because it potentially is just that, considering it's the currently supposed replacement episode for The Missing Coach. So in that regard, it's sort of nothingness pretty much adds up. It is just filler. That being said, it's not a bad episode, but it just feels very unimportant in a season full of plot arcs. Okay, final ads, I promise. The word I would use to describe Season 2 is innovative. Season 2 is innovative in a lot of ways. Some ways I hadn't even realized until I started making this video. It was innovative in how much they experimented with the camera movements and built the sets to accompany that. It was innovative in how it cleverly wove together 26 seemingly randomly selected episodes 
and made a cohesive plot narrative out of them all. It was innovative in how it leveraged a newer, darker tone while keeping the light-hearted storybook feel that Thomas the Tank Engine is known for. And it was innovative in that it introduced so many new beloved staples for the series moving forward. Season 2 is not just more of what we got in Season 1. Season 2 is a continuation of Season 1, showing real growth in all aspects, from how it was filmed, to tone, to the characters. And really, that's what a good sequel should do. Season 2 complements the legend Season 1 started, and builds upon it. What on earth will they do next? Well, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed this episode of the Thomas Retrospective. I sure did. I'm glad the first episode went over very well with people. This is a series I have really been enjoying putting together. The format of this is starting to take shape, so I'm excited to see how it'll evolve as we get into the later seasons. It's definitely going to structure now. I'd like to take now. a moment here to promote a couple things. First of all, I'd like to bring some attention to one of the actual Thomas Music composers himself, Mike O'Donnell. It was Mike O'Donnell, an avid yeah. fan of my content and a really friendly guy. He is responsible for many of the classic themes in the original Thomas series. Mattel has no plans to release the show's soundtrack officially, so he's been working on recreations of all the old themes for the public so they never fall into obscurity. The music is available for purchase in a special bundle pack on his website, Mod Music. On the screen now is a discount code. If you wish to purchase Ooh. the bundle, use this code at checkout and get 15% off. Link in the description. As Mike is one of the men responsible for creating the soundtrack that basically defined my childhood, I want to do what I can to help promote his stuff. I highly recommend checking it out. Also, once again, if you are interested, I do have a Patreon open now. If you choose to pledge, you will get special perks such as two-day early access to videos, you get to vote on what the next video topic is about, access to the PSD files for my video thumbnails, and you get your name in the credits of every new video, just like the ones you see on screen right now. Click the link in the description. Let me know if you want me to do a Patreon. Please let me like. know. My Patreon I'm has exploded over the last couple of weeks, and I really can't thank you all enough for your show of support. That really helps me out as a content creator, so I can continue to make the best content I can for you all at a consistent rate. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, what do you want? I mean, what do you want me to say? The unlucky tug is so good. Just. How he, how he finds new stuff, like, it, it's, I'm beating a dead horse at this point, but just how he manages to find new stuff and so coherently explain it, um, for something that's like a, for like Thomas, for like Thomas of all things, like how he manages, like one, it shows kind of just how, how much thought was put into the actual show. And so you have a deeper respect for the show itself. And two, oh, oh God, what was I going to say? It's just. He just explains it so kind of so maturely, but at the same time so casually. And it's I just I love seeing this. I love watching this guy because he's just because like this we know like the state the show is in. We know kind of we're aware of kind of everything that's been going on with like Mattel and unfortunately All Engines Go is unfor is doing quite well. I say unfortunately because come on, the who likes all engines go? Let's be honest. Who likes it? And it's just, it kind of makes me a little bit emotional uh, seeing kind of just the unlucky dog's passion for it. And I, if, if, if you do like by some miracle, see, see this unlucky dog, keep doing what you're doing because you are, you're an inspiration to me. You're an inspiration to others. And you are just, you cut co you constantly pump out good content and you are absolutely amazing honestly i uh, yeah um <laughs> so again thank you for being thank you for making this, this is absolutely i have so much fun with this as for um season two it's definitely um it's definitely opened my eyes to a few things um like that word innovative just kind of 
noticing the little details, like little technical details in the production. Like, yeah, they are noticeable, but it's it's one of those things which kind of like the like the kind of mo camera movement and like the gritty atmosphere. It's one of those things which you definitely notice, like in the back of your mind, but you don't necessarily um, you don't necessarily um, speak them clearly in your mind. He he speaks it so coherently as well, and he like and he engages you with just the pacing of his videos and like the structure, and just creating something like finding something new to say about it. It's, and season two itself is, it definitely, I definitely have a deeper respect for season two now, just for kind of, for doing what a sequel needs to do. And it's, it's like, again, like every Thomas classic series has a special place in my heart, but it, it, it's one, it's one, it's one of those things that just kind of, I never, it's one of those things where like, because of how long I've been around the show, um, I never, I never thought I'd find new stuff to kind of think about it but he somehow does he's one of perhaps one of the most intelligent human beings i've seen uh, on the internet ironically enough just how not necessarily like in terms of like um how he how he speaks but um just just how he how he manages to kind of we weave and kind of work around and explain um the sh the show this show of all things, that like this kind of Thomas, to, like Thomas, like kids content, how he manages to kind of explain and analyze it, it's just incredible. I do want to do more Unlucky Tug content. I definitely will. Um, but at the same time, you guys are just going to have to be, I don't know when the next one will be. Maybe it will be the season three retrospect, which is actually uh, my personal favorite season, uh, believe it or not. Um, <sighs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I know it's just another phenomenal video. Like I really enjoy, I really do enjoy his his content. It's just the only thing is I don't want to kind of be specifically like drawn just to his content because like it's a, it's only really kind of you people only really watch like unlucky tug content or Victor Tanzig content or Thomas Sinek. Um, it's it's just kind of my reactions to it. I mean, and it's just like I don't I don't I don't know what to do sometimes. I really don't know what to do. Uh. But I will definitely continue reacting to Unlucky Dogs. Definitely when um, Season 3 Retrospective comes out. And you guys just keep being awesome. You know, just keep keep supporting the channel. And do let me know if you would like me to start a Patreon. Because um, it's definitely an idea I have formulated in my mind. Just kind of, just so people can have the option. And just so, in case I do, um, enjoy, in case I do kind of find like consistent content that I kind of want want to kind of do then I will, I will I will keep doing it really it's just this channel is going through especially considering I'm running up to um a thousand subs this channel is going through a bit of an identity crisis but well, I am anyway like I don't know if I will make a career out of this channel honestly I don't I don't think it's likely but it's kind of you guys are just so supportive and you, you guys, you guys are the fucking best, honestly. I apologize, uh, and I, 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 I swear a lot, and I'm like, I'm not particularly funny, I do stumble over my words a lot, I do apologize, but seriously, and I guess maybe why I'm saying it now is because um, if this is the video that gets me over the finish line to a thousand subs, honestly, it would mean the world to me, just to reach a thousand subs. I cannot, I, I will, I will probably cry. I will pr I will probably break down and cry when I when I hit a thousand subs because, but um yeah like I said that's that's neither here nor there so um hope you guys enjoyed this video drop the video a like if you if you if you do want to see more content like this um and subscribe to the channel too because we are like I said we are desperately desperately close to a thousand so um keep being awesome guys and I'll keep I'll keep you posted and this is the last speaking I'll see you guys next time.